Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure. We are on. continuing our series, Questions About the Quran. And now I want to ask, who is the author of the Quran? Because, you know, if you if you pick up a Quran, there is no author. You know, when you pick up a book, you can see, okay, written by this person. But mm -hmm. the Quran, no author. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but within the Quran itself, I mean, while there is no cover page that says author of God, um, the, within the Quran, we, we can see that the the address or that the one who is speaking uh, to the reader is is God because the 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 speaker is saying um, we created you mm. and, and so on mm -hmm. and to us you will return you're, you're going to come back to God and um, um, you, you, it says in the Quran itself in the beginning of the 55th chapter Ar-Rahman Allam al-Quran the the merciful God uh, taught the Quran, hmm. meaning to the Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, and um, the, we, we go on and on and we see that the Quran, it is general. You might find some passages in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, is addressing God. And, and we are given those passages, according to Muslim interpreters, to be used in our prayers. Like, for example, the first chapter of the Quran that begins by praising God. So God is spoken about in the third person. But there's a lot of, lot of first person, singular and plural uh, address, um, uh, like the, the, the address soar is, is in the first person, either singular or plural. And that too requires some further explanation. Muslim scholars uh, say that uh, when God wants to emphasize this oneness, the, um, the singular uh, is used and when he wants to uh, emphasize his majesty and his powers he uses the plural mm -hmm. um, th there's no neat subdivision th this way but that that's one suggestion as to why there is a there is a plural uh, but in any case the idea that there is only one god is so uh, clearly uh, drummed on uh, on and on in the quran that uh, muslims have not come away with any other understanding but that there is only one God. So, so sometimes that, you know, uh -huh. I, I can imagine someone who is not a Muslim listening to what you're saying and saying, that's absurd. Like, how is it possible <laughs> that God wrote this book that we have? Yeah. I mean, surely the Prophet Muhammad must have written it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of penning the book, you know, like we have in the Old Testament that God wrote uh, with his own finger on two stone tablets mm. and gave them to Moses. So the idea of God uh, writing is, is not foreign to the Judeo-Christian um, uh, thought. But, uh, you, you know, in terms of science and, and so on, we, we would wonder how did God write on, on a page, whether it is a stone tablet or, or, a, or a paper page or, you know, parchment from the old times. Um, the answer to that from the Muslim point, point of view is that, uh, well, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the Quran as, as a revelation somehow impressed into his mind. The Quran says, Allah qalbik, uh, on, on, onto your heart, which is a way of speaking of the mind in, in that time and context. Uh, so it was revealed into the mind of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and then the Prophet, peace be upon him, recited it, dictated it to his companions, uh, which is our way of saying his disciples. And then his disciples wrote down the Quran for mm. him because he himself was not trained to read or write. Uh, and so they would read it back to him and he could verify that uh, what they're reading is, is basically what he dictated to them, or at least he approves of their reading. So that's how the Quran came to be penned in, in our world. So someone might say, well, surely the Prophet Muhammad must have come up with it in his mind and then projected it onto, the Prophet, uh, onto God. As, you know, there have been other prophets in other religions who have done similar things. Yeah, so uh, some uh, evidence uh, will point against that because the, the Quran is addressing the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and uh, commanding him on what to do. And on occasion, even criticizing him for some of his behavior. For example, the beginning of the 82nd chapter of the Quran, which says, Abba Sawa Tawalla and Ja'ahul Ama. Uh, he frowned and turned away when the blind man came to him. Uh, the story behind this, according to Muslim commentators, is that, uh, you know, a blind man came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, at a time when he was uh, uh, engaged in trying to give the message to the Quraysh dignitaries at the time, who were opposed to the Islamic faith. Uh, and um, with the obvious aim that if he could convince those dignitaries, they, uh, you know, their conviction would have uh, would, would result in some benefits for Muslims in general, including this uh, blind Muslim. Uh, 
but the Quran is setting up a new way of looking at things and saying, okay, you should pay attention to this person. Never mind that he is low on the on the totem pole. Um, so, so this is a criticism of mm-hmm. the Prophet on from the part of God. And uh, if the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is coming up with all of this in his own psyche, and and he is producing a book on this basis, uh, then uh, he we might be thought of about to be like a somewhat disturbed individual. Mm. Uh, but we know him, I mean, history, even people who do not regard him to be a prophet and messenger of God would nonetheless classify him as one of the sage persons of history, one of the wisdom teachers. Uh, and apart from his uh, being a wisdom teacher, he was also a, a capable leader. Um, he was a military commander. He was uh, a statesman. Uh, he was the leader of his of his community. So the it was, this psychological um, explanation does not go the full length, though one might say, okay, well, let us suppose that uh, he he has uh, some things he wants to, to say to his people. He's obsessed about these things, and these ideas well up in his own mind. And uh, and then eventually he starts to speak about these things, and he becomes convinced that it, these ideas are not really his own; mm-hmm. they they are really from God. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and with this conviction, he is speaking and saying honestly and truthfully that okay, God is speaking to me, uh, but but we know from a scientific point of view that this is just in his mind. Well, the answer to that, and in fact, somebody has proposed this: William Montgomery Watt in his book Muhammad at Mecca propose something like this, uh, trying to explain the Quran from a purely naturalistic point of view, mm-hmm. uh, because everything from the, from the naturalist's uh, point of view must uh, be due to you know, something physical here on the earth. It cannot be coming from heaven. But, but the faith uh, perspective steps in and says, no, why, why should we say that this is only from a naturalistic point of view? Uh, why couldn't it be that God is revealing this to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Uh, and, and that's the, the believer's point of view. So this is where the, the, the difference is between the point of view of the believer and the naturalist. The naturalist will try to explain everything from the naturalistic point of view. And the believer can say, well, wait a minute, we're not denying naturalistic explanations, but there could be something else in addition to that, which is the divine inspiration. So this is what you're describing as this idea welling up in the mind of the individual till he becomes convinced that it is God who is speaking to him. Well, at some point, uh, we we have to accept that it is God who is causing this sort of uh, idea to well up in the mind of this individual, hmm. uh, and and to for this these ideas to come out in these precise words, which we we find are are important from from different perspectives. Which, if we have time, we'll go into. Um, so we see that there is some divine guidance behind this. It's not it's not all due to what a person could have thought at that time. And uh, in, in any case, when we think about the moral teachings and guidance that comes out of this, we realize that this person is divinely guided, hmm. as guided as previously known figures like Jesus and Moses and, and David and so on. Otherwise, if we take this naturalistic explanation, we have to use this across the board. And as Hans Kuhn uh, pointed out in his book, uh, Islam, Past, Present and Future, uh, we, we have to evaluate the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, the same way we evaluate the, the uh, previous prophets. And it would be hypocrisy, he says, for us to, on the one hand, think that the Hebrew prophets were all inspired. And then when we come to Muhammad, we, we start you know, giving a different uh, explanation. So you have to have this similar type of um, evaluation. And then when you do that, you see that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, from an historical point of view, is similar to the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. When you read the Quran, Dr. Shabir, do you get a sense that it's from sort of like a bird's eye view or even beyond in the sense that the author of the Quran is speaking about things that the Prophet Muhammad could not have any knowledge about? Yes, it's 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 more than from a bird's eye view, because rather than being the kind of knowledge that was available on the ground, the Quran actually says uh, explicitly in in the eleventh chapter in the forty ninth verse, "Tilka min al This is information uh, from the unseen sources that we reveal to you. Mm. Uh, neither you nor your people knew it before this. 
So the Quran is uh, already aware that this is new information that, and being given to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he and his contemporaries were not aware of. If the Prophet was uh, making this up on his own, he, he had to be aware that there would be other people who, like him, would be privy to the same information. And, and he wouldn't put a verse like this because that would expose him to the immediate risk of uh, being contradicted. Uh, and, and, and apart from this assertion, we, we can see that in retrospect, there are things which are mentioned in the Quran, which uh, uh, with our modern knowledge, we can see to be true and, and amazingly so. Because, uh, for example, if we think about things said about past history, things that were not known to the contemporaries of the Prophet, peace be upon him, independent historical inves investigations prove them to be true. Uh, things that are mentioned about the future, and only God knows the future, and then the future unfolds exactly as the, already described in the Quran. Uh, things that have uh, scientific import, though the Quran is not a scientific textbook, but it, it calls us to observe the things around us, which are scientific things. And uh, we can see that the way in which the Quran describes what could be observed uh, using the expressions and, and, and words which are there in the Quran, uh, th this is surprising because we can see that the words are very accurate, good descriptions that we know from a scientific perspective today. For example, if we talk about uh, the expansion of the universe, the Quran says in Surah 51, verse number 47, that the universe is, God is expanding the universe. Uh, which is a modern concept. Uh, the Quran in describing small things like the growth and development of the human embryo speaks about the various stages from uh, a selection uh, out of a despised fluid we are created and then God changes that into a, a thing that clings. And, and we know today, we can see, you know, through ultrasound how the baby is clinging to the uh, mother's uterine wall. Um, then, then the Quran says, from that we created you, we changed you into a chewed lump. And at an early stage, like 28 days old, the embryo does actually look like a chewed, like if somebody has bit into mm -hmm. it to leave teeth marks and, uh, and so on. Like the, the details which are mentioned in the Quran does not, do not seem to be details that would have come from the mind of a 7th century Arab, whether the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or anyone around him. And since we know the Quran to, to have been with us from that time, we can see that uh, this ancient book uh, nonetheless contains uh, statements and uh, uses words uh, which are expressive of uh, a level of knowledge which was not on the ground. This is uh, more than a bird's eye view mm -hmm. uh, knowledge. It, it is for the Muslim uh, a, a, a revelation from the Almighty God. Thank you for that, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe, and please donate to support our work at QuranSpeaks.com.